I'm Jasmine Moradi, and you're listening to the Power of Audio, Science and AI. My guest today is the <laughs> one and only Dr. Charles Spence, Professor of Experimental Psychology and Head of the Cross Model Research Laboratory at the Department of Experimental Psychology at Oxford University. He's a gastrophysicist working at the interface between chefs, food companies and technology. Charles is passionate about how people perceive the world around them, in particularly how our brains manage to process the information from each of our different senses to form the extraordinary, rich multisensory experience that fill our daily lives. His research focuses on how a better understanding of the human mind will lead to the better design of multisensory foods, products, interfaces, and environments in the future. Charles has published more than 500 articles in top scientific journals and has been awarded many prestigious psychology prizes. In this episode, Charles and I are going to discuss the ins and outs of sonic seasoning when food, sound, and neuroscience intertwine to create the perfect food and drinking experience. With that, Charles, I welcome you and thank you so much for joining us. It's a pleasure. How are you doing and how are things in Colombia? Yeah, very well, on sabbatical at the moment. So uh, hopefully be here in Colombia rather than in Oxford for eight months in total, all being well. And uh, yes, a little, little farm in the mountains um, surrounded by nature. So uh, it's all good apart from we're in the middle of rainy season at the moment. So. Uh, it's had a monster, a monster storm yesterday and uh, washed away this, that and the other. But uh, apart from that, that's good. Well, you're probably used to the rain, right? Coming from the UK. <laughs> <laughs> so I would say, so I would say. <laughs> so now I want to get to know you a little bit better. So looking back in the mirror, what was it in your inner motivational drive and the curiosity as a boy that brought you to becoming an experimental psychologist and a gastrophysicist? Uh, so I certainly probably didn't know what psychology was and gastrophysics didn't exist uh, a decade ago, never mind, four or five decades ago when I was a little boy. Um, so uh, as you know, it feels in hindsight almost like a kind of um, accidental path. Uh, not really planned out, though um, I think to get into psychology in the first place, that was all a matter of, um, uh, I used to go to my local library in Leeds in the north of England and um, take out books to borrow and supposedly to read. And I used to do take lots of philosophy books out um, and then sort of return them after reading no more than the back cover because they're all too complicated. And uh, once I'd been through the library's um, philosophy section, the next thing along the shelf was psychology alphabetically so I started dipping into some of those books and that was uh, kind of interesting and um, I think probably the thing for me that uh, drew me to it was was that unlike other sciences uh, the answers are still a, a newer a newer field so a lot more evolution and a lot more argument and so you're not just being told what's the case it's kind of you know seemed to offer the opportunity to to actually try and find out the truth, whatever that is, and um, and to uh, yeah, to, to sort of argue with people, and and if you had a good idea or a good experiment, then you could sort of you know prove something, and it didn't require lots of equipment and money and uh, just you know a good idea and um, a bit of intuition, and off you go, um, and uh, yeah, and then, and then from starting in psychology, that got into the senses. Um, to go by accident because I had to do a project and somebody had a broken TV and my first experiments in psychology were of kind of breaking TVs effectively and moving the sounds around and seeing what happened. Um, and ever since uh, I've been sort of adding more senses to the mix, would never have thought of getting into, I mean, initially it was all warning signals for car drivers and technology and um, audio visual and maybe a bit of touch. I uh, would never have thought of getting into food just because none of the other psychologists seem to get into food. 
And then it kind of turned out once you got into the world of smell and taste, it was really interesting. And there were lots of um, not much studied, but kind of evolutionarily interesting. Uh, and there's always like some theoretical questions there. And uh, yeah, just one thing led to another. And uh, uh, then we got introduced to some chefs and then those chefs got famous and and suddenly things took off. And, and now I spend most of my time trying to tell other people especially the psychologists, you know, even if you're not interested in studying food, you should be interested in food. So it's probably what got our brains evolved quite the way they are. Um, and sort of become an evangelist, I guess, for food psychology and gastrophysics. Uh, but uh, yeah, in hindsight, all kind of an accident of, you know, um, a broken television, uh, <laughs> the arrangement of uh, subjects in the, in the, in the, in the uh, local library and uh, so on. Well, it sounds like a great uh, accident, I would say. <laughs> and when you arrived at Oxford University back in 1988, you also discovered that the psychologists were studying sight in one lab and hearing in another, and that neuroscience and psychology had always explored senses separately but you knew that all our senses are immediately connected. So teach us about your multisensory perception and your cross-model research methodology that you call sensploration. I arrived in, in Oxford as a student in, in 1988 and then sort of came back as a lecturer in 1997. Uh, and it was on my return that uh, I got sort of shown to a lab. Uh, there was no electricity at the time. The walls were all painted black. And with a torch, kind of the... Um, the uh, administrator said, oh, this could be yours, pointing around uh, <laughs> into this most unappealing looking kind of a space with no windows. Um, and that became home for uh, a while. And uh, that lab was sort of set between the, uh, the hearing guy and the uh, seeing guy. Pro professors had been in the department for decades who taught me when I was a, a student years before um, and who for some reason or other had sort of fallen out over something that somebody said to somebody else some years ago and they hadn't been speaking to each other for literally for, for, for decades um and it's sort of ironic because on the one hand it seemed like they didn't think that anything was missing that uh the person who studies vision and the eye can learn everything they need to know without having to think about the ear or the tongue or the nose uh whereas the hearing guy thinks you know everything i need to know is is, is within the ear and, and so on so we're not losing anything by not communicating. The idea that the senses connect, on the one hand, it's sort of obvious they do. Anyone who's seen the McGurk video with the voices saying bar and da um, knows that. Anyone who's you know thought about the ventriloquist's dummy illusion, uh, how we hear voices where we see lips, uh, kind of knows that the senses connect. Um, and, and I suppose people have just not tried to connect them before because Maybe the brain's a really complicated thing, so how on earth are we going to understand it? Maybe we break it up into parts. We say, OK, let's just study vision and make it a problem a bit easier, or let's just study hearing. Um, but uh, given that the senses are connected all the time, sort of inspired by some of the work coming from the neuroscience, from, from those studying animal models, looking at the connection between the senses in the 70s and 80s. And, um, uh, and when I started out, I was trying to sort of apply some of the same rules of the brain to human perception and in particular for me um, I've always been interested in applying psychology so applied cognitive psychology trying to take the insights about how the senses are connected um, and then think about how they can be used to design better warning signals or environments or uh, these days foods drinks packaging and experiences and so on um, and just because no one's been looking at this area it was really great because there's, there's lots to do and I could just take any experiment that somebody had done previously in vision and say, how would it work in an audio-visual situation? And uh, the sort of idea of, uh, uh, of sense exploration is uh, one that sort of, I think the term I first see it coined in about 2015, um, and is, I think it captures, uh, as a name for all these events that were sort of happening all over the place, both in the world of uh, sort of experiential marketing with the likes of the Singleton Sensorium we're involved in or the Campo Viejo Color Lab, we have people tasting something and there's music and there's lights and there's shapes and there's all sorts of strange stuff going uh, through to, to exhibitions in museums like the Tate Sensorium 
uh, in London in 2015, where again, you had paintings that were to be viewed while listening to strange sounds, feeling virtual touch, smelling stuff and eating. Um, and so this sort of inspiration is sort of the name then for, for the interest that I think the general public have in uh, understanding how their senses connect. Uh, and there's that exploration bit at the end that says it's not just what marketeers, maybe the intuitive marketeers have been doing for decades, which is creating, you know, uh, multi-sensory experiences in store to make you buy more or drink more or shop longer. But really, it's more of a sort of questioning thing of, uh, of putting people in environments and saying, we're not quite sure how the things connect. And maybe there is no right answer for how your hearing matches your vision, matches your touch. Uh, but let's explore this together, the world of your senses, hence sense exploration. And it's something I think consumers are very, seem to be very uh, resonate with. They're curious and they're surprised by some of the connections that we sort of show people. I want to explore them more and then hopefully think about how those, you know, those almost synesthetic connections between the senses um, can be uh, incorporated into the design of everyday life. So how do you measure then sense exploration? It, 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 you do it in the lab, in the field. And I, I know that you've told a story about uh, like the brain machine in New York, where the participants were drinking at the same time as they were lying in the machine. I've tested one of those machines. I couldn't last a, a minute. And I've done uh, in-store music myself. And, and it's mostly in the stores because that is the experience, as you say, everything is happening at once, not just test the music itself. Well, a lot of the research we do is inspired by the brain science and the neuroscience. Um, and 5% you know, of the time we do stick people in the brain scanner to see how things are wired up for our basic research. Uh, when it comes to applied things, um, I don't really see there's much benefit to uh, neuromarketing, should we say, uh, as it's called, partly because it's it sort of, you know, it's, it's expensive and slow and doesn't answer subtle questions. And, and you know, if it, especially for food and drink, lying isolated in a tube with a, with a tube in your mouth as well, <laughs> squirting liquid that you can't swallow, that you can't really get the flavor of, is nothing like a real life. And hence in our research, um, we try, I mean, go back 10 years and, and most of the experiments we did were done in the laboratory. We would invite some number of participants in and then ask them questions. Um, and as the years have gone by, that sort of shifted increasingly to online experiments where we can test a much greater number of people much more quickly. You know, uh, hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands, even on occasion of people uh, over the internet um, to pick up some of these connections between their senses. Um, and also a big one for us is uh, if, if you're working in the world of food and drink, maybe sometimes at least you want to give people actual things to taste and to smell. And for that, you need real people, but often you only need them very briefly. So uh, we do a lot of work at food festivals, music festivals, book festivals, uh, you name it, any kind of sort of you know, public gathering uh, where we can then collect lots of data uh, in the wild. It's a bit noisier, but we get you know huge numbers of people. And uh, for example, we've just been doing work with my colleague uh, Felipe uh, Reynoso Cavallo, sort of Brazilian, um, but doing a lot of work on sort of sound design and, and music to change the taste of chocolates. And there, he's been over in, in the Far East, in Korea, and in Japan, um, and being able to test you know, 1,500, 2,000 people at these kind of festivals. Um, I, 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 and it sort of both collects then data. Uh, everyone gets to eat a chocolate or taste a beer or, or something like that. Um, and we get sort of data as well about how music affects the taste of the chocolate. People come out having had a chocolate and, and maybe thinking a bit more about how their senses connect. And that's a great way to collect data, I think, too. And it's like now kind of this combined approach. And that really, well, in part, uh, my department in Oxford closed down and has been destroyed because of asbestos. So there isn't really a physical lab. And of course, with COVID, there's virtually no in-person testing for the last year anyway. But as it happens, given that we've done more stuff online and, and in these sort of live event settings, that's um, the new normal. Uh, and the sort of way we do it then is uh, we might um, yeah, ask people to 
If you've got them in person, we might give them a dark and a milk chocolate. If we're doing it online, we might say, imagine the taste of dark and milk chocolate, uh, and then give them some shapes to pick and say, you know, which shape matches your taste experience of the milk chocolate, which shape or sound or texture or color matches the experience of the dark chocolate. Ask lots of people the same question. Uh, see if there's any systematic patterns that sweet tastes are high pitch, bitter tastes are low pitch and dark and angular. You know, sweet is round and, and curvy and pink and uh, uh, probably more satin than, than, than velvet and um, pick up these associations or correspondences, I like to call them, uh, and then feed them into uh, the sense exploration events, working with uh people like steve keller who's taken here some of our findings and turned them into sort of nice to listen to uh sonic seasoning or with philippe too he's sort of a sound designer so he can create these great soundscapes or pick from the shelf pre-existing music that embodies some of these connections uh we work with you know plateware designers potters uh cutlery manufacturers uh typeface designers uh increasingly to try and you know, take these findings and then put them into designed experiences or things artifacts or products uh and then test again to see does this say sonic sweetener if we're thinking about the musical case does it really make things taste sweeter or not and which of these different sonic sweeteners that that you know we've come up with or other people have come up with does the best job which is the sweetest music um and it sort of goes that way. Um, so it's liberating in a way to be able to test far more people far more quickly over the internet in, the, in these large scale events. It uh, offends a few in the traditional sensory science community who say that's not the way you need to have expert panelists who've been trained for years to share the same vocabulary of what they're tasting, what they're smelling. Uh, but for us, I think um, no, the average person is who I'm interested in um, and how we can modify their experience uh, and, and understand them better through you know, these sort of sense exploration ex experiment or I mean, sort of multi-sensory experiential and experimental events. Um, wow, very, very interesting. I agree with you. You need to do the, the, the consumers, not the experts, because it's the consumers that is actually using it. So I've watched your video about sense exploration, and in it you state the three neuroscience principles you live by, sensory dominance, superadditive, and subadditive, or incongruous as it's all called. Mm -hmm. Let us start with you teaching us about sensory dominance. When a sense overpowers another, the McClure effect, the connection between what we see and what we hear. Mm -hmm. So um, the reason why, studying the senses separately doesn't work um, and the reason why many marketeers who've sort of started to get interested in the senses but sort of you know just add they do something in vision they do something in hearing sort of add them together and imagine if it works in each sense it'll work together uh, in fact what the neuroscience cognitive neuroscience brings to the table i think is the realization that the brain doesn't just kind of add the senses in a very linear, predictable manner. Instead, there are various shortcuts and rules and um, um, potentially more efficient ways of doing things uh, that are sort of embodied in these three rules. Sensory dominance, superadditivity, and subadditivity. Sensory dominance, the first is probably my favorite because that comes more from the philosophy side uh, where my passions long ago were and more from the behavioral side, whereas the other two principles come more from the neurophysiology the other camp, as it were, um, and sensory dominance is just the idea that our brain sometimes uses one sense to dominate the total experience, the multisensory experience. So, um, for example, when you're at the cinema or when you are listening to the, the ventriloquist's dummy, the voice is coming from one location, the lips are seen moving somewhere else on the screen or on the dummy itself, and yet our brain seems to use vision to dominate what we hear and we hear the voice coming from where we see the lips that's vision dominating hearing the same uh, in a way with the McGurk effect when the lips say one thing and the voice you hear is some saying something different when you combine them in the brain which happens automatically and immediately 
uh, Vision again seems to dominate. And lots of the time, Vision does dominate. Um, but I, I sort of my belief that in fact, every sense dominates for something. Um, hearing that dominates, you know, when things happen, how quickly they change, temporal stuff. Vision dominates for what is it, maybe where is it. Um, but maybe touch and smell are more dominant for affective judgments and emotional stuff. Taste is probably the, the only sense that can really tell you about uh, to see the nutritional properties of, of foods and whether they're poisonous or not. Uh, and so for us, then um, it's been half of my time trying to say sensory dominance is a key principle, definitely in the lab, but probably also in the real world. Um, and uh, but trying to you know, draw people away from the the visual dominance that uh, most scientists and people you know, more of our vein is given over to vision than to any other sense, and hence it's natural for any of us to always sort of think visually. Um, and you know, for example, currently you know doing a lot of work in the in the world of sort of you know, uh, audio branding, and it's not that necessarily I think audio branding is more important than visual branding because we are visually dominant. It's just there's been so much research in visual branding and logos and such like that kind of the audio bit's been left behind. And what do you think that? What why do you think it's been neglected? I guess our experience is really maybe we think visually. Um, more of our brain is given over to sort of vision than any other sense. We're quite a long way. So it's sort of wired that way. Uh, I guess because then that it means that uh, vision helps us predict better the world around us than any other sense. And that it's sort of constantly there. We can see the distance. So, so you know, well, the work is around visual dominance over taste. Um, when we change the color of food or a drink and, you know, convince the wine experts that that rosé wine that they're looking at really tastes of tropical fruit, when in fact it's a white wine colored. So we're sort of fooling them by visual dominance. If they see a pink wine, they taste a pink wine, they smell a pink wine. Um, and, uh, but that, while it, it, it becomes sort of a party trick or a fun thing in the restaurant or setting uh, in the real world, I guess, it would make no sense for us to have to put everything into our mouths to see what it tasted like. Far more efficient for our brains to use our eyes to predict that red things are ripe things are sweet, are more energy dense, where green things tend to taste sour and are unripe and unfulfilling. Um, and so it's, it's that sort of predictive ability of vision uh, that, that that I think leads to in part to its um, in part to its to its dominance. Because at another level, I suppose people might say that it's something also about uh, you know, our, our shift from uh, four legs to two legs sometime in the past. What that did is both allowed us to see further as our head moved above the, uh, the undergrowth, but also took our nose away from the smelly earth. Uh, and hence it was that <laughs> shift that in part led to the rebalancing and what about the next one, super additive, when senses work together to enhance the experience? Teach us about that. So super additive is the idea that sometimes one plus one equals three. Um, it's the idea that our brain may combine faint sensations, that we are hardly aware we're smelling or seeing or touching, uh, and combine them to give rise to a, a much richer percept or brain response than the sum of the parts. Um, and I give examples either maybe everyday ones of those who who, who wear glasses. Uh, if they're in a noisy party, then they can't hear by their ear alone what anybody's saying. If they put the glasses on and just look, they can probably tell if somebody's mouthing a swear word or their own name, but nothing else. They can't follow a conversation. But put your glasses on, look at the person you're trying to listen to, and suddenly you can hear the conversation. So neither hearing nor vision was enough by itself to, to allow you to converse, but in the combination of a super additive response. Uh, or my other favorite one is, is um, from one of my colleagues in the um, flavor industry, uh, Tony Blake, who retired a few years ago, but used to work at Furmanish, and he was a child of the Second World War uh, when there wasn't much food going around. Uh, and you know, he used to say kids in um, uh, at the time were told when you get some chewing gum, uh, if it loses its flavor, take it out and just roll it in some icing sugar and then put it back in your mouth and suddenly the mint flavor has returned. 
Icing sugar doesn't taste of mint by itself. The chewing gum, once you've chewed it enough, tastes of nothing. So these two things individually don't work, but put them together and somehow there's a super additive flavor response uh, that results. Um, and this is the you know, principle that sounds great and I think does have some application. Though uh, it's also one that um, uh, yeah, a few of the marketeers have perhaps got overexcited by, shall we say, <laughs> um, uh, and that they're convinced that, you know, this will be this 1200% increase in, in, in marketing effectiveness if we combine the senses. That is a, you know, a, 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 a almost verbatim <laughs> quote from, from one of my colleagues. And that's probably not likely to happen most of the time. But still, the general idea that you know the senses don't just add together linearly, and that sometimes you can get a bigger boost by making sure that the senses work congruently is one that I think is worth bearing in mind, and certainly does have some application in the in mm. the marketplace. And then now the third one and the last one: when senses clash and can ruin the experience. Um, so again, this is the a problem of sort of sub additivity or what happens when the senses give sort of incongruent messages. And um, it's one that again, one often sees in the world of sensory marketeers uh, who have got onto the multi-sensory bandwagon who've started thinking about, you know, five sensory touch points and, uh, and so on and, and, and branding for all the senses, but they think of the senses independently um, and the danger is that you then create some sort of experience that the consumer can't read or interpret properly because the senses are telling incongruent messages. And for me, that's, you know, um, the everyday example of that is for those who watch the you new know, dubbed foreign movies. Maybe you can see George Clooney and he looks sort of gorgeous on the screen. But if it's dubbed in some funny language, <laughs> the voice you can probably understand, but the lips and the voice just don't quite match up. And the experience is just somehow incongruent. It just doesn't work. Um, and hence you value it less. Um, and you see that in, 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 in the real world, uh, for example, in those studies of like um, you know, shopping centers uh, and malls where they introduce music to try and increase sales, they introduce fragrance to try and increase sales and, and lingering length. Uh, and those may work individually, but then when they put them together, sales decline below where they were with the individual senses and that's either because maybe you've got an alerting upbeat music with a calming relaxing scent so the senses are incongruent consumer doesn't know what's going on can't resolve it um or you know on occasion that maybe you've, you've reached sensory overload when there's just too much going on for the consumer but that sort of idea that when the senses are incongruent when you haven't thought whether they work well together can lead to a suppressed response in the brain so let's get into food and dining. You've co-written the book, The Perfect Meal, The Multisensory Science of Food and Dining, in the search for the perfect meal, which you call the gastronomic satisfaction. So tell me, is there anything really like a perfect meal? Can it really be studied as human experience and expectations are so different? It's something that you know, people haven't really studied before because you know, for, for you, it might be you know, uh, fish and chips by the seaside. Maybe it is for me, uh, or it might be a picnic, or it might be you know a um, going to the middle of the uh, uh, of the uh, sort of Swedish forest for a for a meal in a, in a in a very exclusive, very hard to get to restaurant. Well, especially hard now it's closed down. But um, so every person probably has a slightly different perfect meal, and yet I think it's not a difficult question to answer. We ask people, you know, what was your best meal ever? People will sort of come up with something. Uh, and that it is different between different people, okay. Um, but you know, we are different as humans, and yet psychology exists as a science, and we can study people, the average kind of response and the sort of factors that influence the play in. Um, and so I think it's worth trying to study it, uh, despite the differences, and look for any commonalities that one might find. And that might you know require you to sort of you know, uh, cluster people into the gastro tourists versus the comfort eaters versus uh, um but they know that idea of you mentioned sort of expectation people's expectations are different well that's part of the perfect meal i think you know what you expect to happen or don't expect to happen and i given the start of the perfect meal for me they're you know, going to uh le chateau briand in in paris ooh, probably a decade ago now uh being recommended by the chef who was working in the lab at the time but he'd recommended a different restaurant the day before and 
it wasn't um, you know, it wasn't all that great. So we went to this one, knowing nothing about it. Uh, and it sort of blew you away because your expectations were low. Mm. It just looked like a bistro. But then once you got inside, suddenly these dishes kept coming out that were, it was like a collective of, you know, young uh, gastronomic chefs. Uh, and dish after dish sort of came out that was really interesting and, uh, and delicious. And it was that better than you expected that made that. And I think very often it can be, you know, better than you expect can be part of what constitutes the perfect meal through to the other bit that um, uh, I gave you, you know, uh, I'm here in Colombia and, and my parents and family have come various times from sort of taking them around, showing them all the fancy restaurants in Bogota, the capital, or in the coast. Uh, and you know, when at the end of the trip, we sort of say, well, what was your best moment? What was the best meal we've had on this, on this sort of trip? Uh, and everyone says, it's not the fancy restaurants in the, in, the, in, the, in the capital. It's this little shack in the middle of a roundabout in Cartagena on the Colombian uh, Caribbean coast with uh, all the taxi drivers honking their horns. And, and it's just um, a prawn cocktail effectively in a plastic cup with a plastic spoon or a plastic chair in the middle of a roundabout, hot and sweaty. Uh, it's sort of all wrong in so many different ways. And yet for all of us, it was you know, without question the best thing. And is that then about the emotion of being then together with your family? And then you can sort of maybe extract the principles and say, okay, these things are important. Uh, expectation is important, anticipation is important, but also I think, you know, when you look at it closely, those great meals, the best meals, they lasted a few minutes, a few hours at best, and they're gone. And yet the memory of that experience stays with you for years, uh, in some cases. And hence, you know, then it becomes a whole question of, maybe I don't really care what your perfect meal is. Actually, I care about your memory of the perfect meal, because that's what stays with you. That's what will determine whether you recommend it to somebody else, go back. Um, and of course, then as a psychologist, knowing that our memory plays tricks on us all the time, Again, these sort of systematic, predictable tricks that maybe make sense in some way. But by knowing that, then you can try and create real experiences with more stiction, as the marketers call it, that will then reside in memory. Um, and, and take that sort of thought, you know, how do we, we create mem truly memorable meals? And that gets you into you know, primacy effects and recency effects and, uh, and multi-course tasting menus that have more chance, more hooks for for sticky memories to be created. Regarding the memory, I would say that when I was living in London and uh, missing Sweden, I could go to Ikea and have a meal and my friends is like, you can go to the fancy restaurant in town. But I'm like, yeah, but it's home, right? It's memory. It's, even if it's that simple, mm -hmm. it's, it's the memories that comes with it. And also like a little bit comfort food, right? Yep. As it reminds Meat me. Meatballs, isn't it? Meatballs. The <laughs> thing, and, um, don't, and don't they serve something like... I saw some statistic that they serve more meals than anyone in the world at bar McDonald's or something like that. <laughs> I'm, I'm, sure crazy. Do. I'm sure they do. Let, let's move on to your work in kitchen theory. Just as you said, you're so lucky to work with food. And I actually also had a great conversation with your friend and colleague, Steve Keller, in my previous podcast. Now I want to know about the fascinating work you do with Joseph Joseph, the founder of kitchen theory involving Steve. And why did you choose to study fine dining? So um, I got into the world of food and psychology and gastrophysics through the food companies, Unilever initially, and then uh, everyone else at some point thereafter. Um, but what I came to realize after a, a one too many kind of corporate workshops where the chefs and those food companies would try and take the science that we were discovering uh, and incorporate it into a new food product. Uh, and nearly always it was a horrible experience. Uh, I remember one case where we had like trying to make a super additive um, kind of chocolate thing. Uh, and the kitchens came back with this thing like a jelly with infused with, 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 with flavorful stuff and you bit into it and then it squirted all over the place. And uh, you could see that they had incorporated the science, but not in a good way. So the innovation happened much, much quicker. Whereas, you know, I was spending years working with cars and, and warning signals there. It might be 20 years. Even if you've got the best idea in the world, it'll still take probably 10, 20 years between that idea being crystallized and it being incorporated into the models of cars that have been produced. So it's so slow. And whereas as soon as you work with the chef, suddenly it speeds up so much faster. Uh, with Joseph, it's been great because it's probably known in now for 
I guess almost a year, no, a year, a decade. And uh, he came to some uh, talk we were giving in London, took a, you know, a, a break from his shift at uh, the Connaught Hotel where he was, he was cooking at the time. Um, and he, like Blumenthal, were very interested in non-traditional insights or sources of knowledge or inspiration uh, that probably, you know, the, the inspiration for the next new thing, the next new dish, the next new approach doesn't come from a chef conference. Um, that may come from listening to how people create wallpaper or how surgeons operate. And these are all examples, you know, that uh, Joseph's been working with uh, the great uh, Roger Kneebone, a surgeon, and, and, and published on the parallels between operating in a kitchen and in a surgery. And we've had lots of fun over the years then collaborating uh, through often I'll find something in psychology or in the gastrophysics, an illusion or something, show it to the chef and say, you know, could we do something in this space? At other times, the chef does stuff. Uh, I will just sort of report back. It's strange, it's, you know, when we serve this this way, people say that, and when we serve the same food, but call it something different, then it feels like diners respond differently. Uh, and that then becomes a source of a next experiment for us to say how important is naming description to, to the dish. As a lot of the dishes on the menu, on the various menus that we've been collaborating on since probably 2013 now, um, have uh, either fed into or been experiments. Um, and Joseph is, is one of the chefs who then sort of uses technology, who has projection mapping over the table for some of the courses, uh, who uses headphones sometimes or, or ambient sound to create moods or to create uh, atmospheres you know, to recreate the forest when serving a mushroom dish that's plated in the way the, the mushroom was found in the forest, for example. Um, and in that multi-sensory sort of digital technology enhanced dining experience, um, the question of which sounds to present is one that uh, the chef can't really address. What has gone beyond his favourite playlist is is uh, Eamon Tobin. He, he used to play for some of the menus uh, and I can't certainly can't do uh, and that's where sort of Steve came in and met him first at uh, actually an audio branding conference but then he came to one of Joseph's uh, meals and we had some fun and that led into then a series of collaborations some between just them two and sometimes between all three of us and sometimes between me and Joseph um, that you know can involve uh, a sonic element and my favorite uh, currently has to be the uh, Jellyfish dish, uh, which has been on the menu for the gastrophysics chef's table, pre-code, of course. Um, and the first course on the menu uh, involving jellyfish, which is not a common food that most Western diners don't like the idea of, um, but which uh, is sustainable. The sea's getting full of jellyfish because of global warming. So a good idea would be to eat them. And the chef is trying to you know, convince diners, not going with the easy option of things they know they like, but with unconventional options that might be more sustainable like jellyfish how to how to present that to diners uh well the chef makes a nice recipe has a cucumber gazpacho serves it on tweezers so questioning what cutlery can be a projection mapping of the sea where the jellyfish might have been floating uh, and then in terms of the soundscape um uh steve came up with this great kind of combination of the, the sound of the sloshing waves uh as, as as an atmospheric sound to match the sea the sea projected on the table but intermittent amongst those sea sounds are the sounds of crunch, like somebody biting on potato chips, um, sort of referencing a, my first food experiment that got much noticed, the sort of sonic chip. Um, and jellyfish, when you cook them, prepare them, they have no taste. It's just a crunchy texture, pure crunch, pure sound in, in, in food. Um, so diners are there at the table eating this jellyfish. And, and what came out of this collaboration is um, I think both the, from Steve and the sort of intelligent and pleasant to listen to layering of sounds, not having just soundscape doing one thing, but multiple things. And then through observation, when diners eat the dish, they've got the headphones on, sometimes they crunch, but the headphones are just playing the sea sounds. Sometimes the headphones crunch, but they're not crunching. And then sometimes crunch, and, and the headphones crunch at the same time. And your brain all the time as a diner is trying to resolve this. Am I hearing myself crunch or not? 
it's kind of integrating, segregating, integrating, segregating in a way that uh, artists like Bruce Nauman have done with, you know, um, lip sync video from the 1960s that he plays with the synchrony and, and it creates this kind of more compelling thing as your brain tries to resolve things that's something that makes sense and then sort of doesn't. Um, and that was not predicted, but kind of came out of the dish, out of the collaboration that we then is written up and uh, published on. And um, yeah, a very nice example of uh, a kind of combination of different skills. Uh, yeah. The kind of creatives of the kitchen making the food. Uh, I've never tried Steve's cooking, but um, I don't imagine it's quite as good as, as Joseph's. Uh, and then Steve's kind of auditory together with kind of the scientific glue, if you will, of why these sounds might work. So I'm interested in what you're saying, the illusion of flavor, because you've also stated that the tongue is the least interesting bit of our experience of flavors, that the perception of food occurs in the mind and in the atmosphere in which we eat and drink, and not just in our mouth. So tell us about this illusion of flavor. So I think all of us think that we taste in our mouth. That's where we feel the stuff moving around and, and the texture. Uh, and yet, if you kind of close your eyes and block your nose and eat something, there's very little experience there. It's just sweet, sour, bit of salty, nothing else. Um, so in fact, the f you know, I think flavor is probably one of the most multi-sensory experiences. So we see food, it's color, it's appearance. We hear the crunch, the crackle, the crispy, the snap, uh, uh, clearly the taste on the, on the tongue, the smell, the aroma, the meaty, the floral, the herbal, uh, not to mention the pain and uh, of chili and so on. And all of that first comes together in, uh, in the brain. That's where the senses integrate your ear with your eye, with your nose, with your mouth. And then our brain plays this amazing trick on us in a way and convinces us all that the experience of flavor we're having is actually coming from that thing in our mouth, which is sort of right in a way. That is where the flavor resides, but we sense it up here and here and there. Um, and I think this, this illusion is a very powerful one. It's something you sort of have to battle against because people, because people don't, intuitively it doesn't feel that way. And that's not like true of much of gastrophysics. Intuitively, it doesn't feel like the lighting or the background music or the chair I'm sitting on has any impact on the taste. That's just not how it feels to me. It feels like I can taste what's in the glass and I would not be fooled by any of this other stuff. Um, and, and the same thing, you know, if it feels like I can really taste in my mouth, it doesn't really feel like I'm, I'm seeing what I'm tasting or I'm, I'm hearing it or... So um, identifying these kind of illusions of flavor and the flavor experience and the role of atmosphere and then trying to demonstrate them to people, I think is important as a first step because if you otherwise, if you don't, if you still believe flavor just happens in here, then I might tell you everything I, I know, but you won't do anything about it because it's not true to your experience. And that's why the, the sense exper experiences, I think, are so important. So I sort of realized some years ago, I used to think that if you did the experiment well and got a significant result and had a nice graph to show, that's it, end of story. You've proved your point and, and things will be different thereafter. Whereas in fact, I sort of realized, no, I was giving too many talks to too many audiences and sort of nod their head politely and then go away and do nothing. You see, how can you just listen to what I said? Either tell me I'm lying or do something about it. There's no other option here. And yet, but then as soon as you, if you can give people the experience, and that was part of the reason behind the Singleton Sensorium where we gave sort of 500 people a glass of whiskey, a scorecard, took them through three environments with different colors and shapes and sounds and smells uh, and got them to rate the whiskey in each room uh, when they came out, they were a different person, many of them. They could see their scorecard and see that they'd said different things about the glass that had not left their hand over the last 15 minutes. Uh, and it was that them experiencing the science, in a way, experiencing the impact of the atmosphere on their taste ratings that then led some, you know, there were some of the serving staff from Long Clue, a famous restaurant in the north of England who were there. But they went back to their restaurant and said, okay, we've got to start serving our whiskey on a wooden board because that was the environment that they'd most enjoy the thing in. And so it's that, you know, how do you, uh, that's a real challenge for me at the moment, then it's, you know, how do you get people to experience the science, to believe it, because it's given that it doesn't fit with our intuitions. Um, and that's why we're you know, working with Joseph and having diners come to the restaurant, only maybe, maybe in small scale, it's only a table for 10 or 12, but then those who've been there will hopefully come away thinking differently about the senses and what's possible. Uh, and those innovative exploratory experiences curated by Joseph, uh, Steve and so on can then hopefully be scaled up 
in our work you know with brands to say okay can we take the dish that worked so well uh at kitchen theory uh, and can we now um create a version that people can download at home as a sensory app next time they buy a tub of ice cream or a packet of pringles or a bottle of champagne whatever it might be yeah and you've scientifically proven that background noise influences people's taste and smell, that it kills our ability to distinguish various aspects of our tasting experience. So is this the reason why airplane food is so tasteless? And which food are suppressed and which are not up in the air? And how can airlines then make the food taste better? So um, part of the problem uh, in the airline is in the airplanes is about noise um, and uh, it's also probably about lowered cabin air pressure, dry air. There's really these three things together that uh, cause the suppression of taste and flavour in what we eat and drink in the air. Uh, people have known about the dry air and the uh, uh, low cabin air pressure before, but what hasn't been brought to the fore is the impact of noise and in an airplane you get 80 to 85 decibels of engine noise, depending whereabouts in the plane you're sitting. Uh, and when we study that in the lab, and others have done this uh, better than us, if you play 80 to 85 decibels of background noise, white noise or en engine noise to participants, their ability to taste sweetness and saltiness is dramatically suppressed. But their ability to taste umami, a mysterious uh, fifth taste, protonaceous taste from Japan originally, that is enhanced bizarrely. So it's not like noise just masks everything, at least in the airplane case, it seems to suppress some tastes while enhancing others. And that, on the one hand, that means that's partly why food tastes of so little in the air, partly why the meals have to add you know, 20 to 30% more sugar and salt to the meals, mm -hmm. just to get the same taste experience in the air. Uh, and for us, um, uh, when we started studying this, you know, for a long time I've been interested in the sound of food and the background noise and music. Um, when we started studying airplane uh, uh, noise, then we sort of made the prediction based on observation that the strange thing about being in an airplane is how many people order a tomato juice or a Bloody Mary. Uh, I don't mind them, but I don't really... The only time I ever order them is in the air. And if you just watch the air, the trolley coming down the airplane, it turns out there are 25% you know, of people who, who fly who will only order a Bloody Mary in the air and never on the ground. So there's something interesting going on the why are people behaving that way. And it turns out, well, tomato juice and Bloody Marys have umami in spades from the tomatoes and also from the Worcester sauce. So this is, it turns out to be one drink that whose taste stands up to the noise of the air and it's almost like people are self-medicating they're picking the drink that it turns out does work well up there um and hence i think you can then spin it out into in sort of um interesting suggestions or applications on the one hand uh, i think many air, airlines now realizing how umami stands up to noise are adjusting their menus some quietly others making um announcing it like British Airways with that umami forward menu of, of a few years ago. Um, and also for me, I, I sort of wonder if umami is the taste that works in the air, why when you get your little tray of food, do they have you a salt, a salt sachet, a pepper sachet? Why, why aren't they giving you umami shake? Fifth taste mix. It doesn't make complete sense that you should be, that's what you should be using for your seasoning in the air. Uh, and yet no one has done it yet for some bizarre reason. Maybe because of a long-standing memory of Chinese restaurant syndrome from the 1970s when you know, people used to think that MSG, uh, the umami taste, was um, was causing uh, all sorts of problems. Yeah, it, it definitely yeah. needs some innovation uh, <laughs> regarding the food. So let's get into the whole sonic uh, seasoning i'm interested to know what happens in our mind when we eat and listen to loud music um so uh, i think loud music uh can become noise if it's too loud it can become unpleasant 
Um, and so uh, part of what loud music will do will depend on whether we think of it as noise or whether we enjoy it uh, or not. So if we don't like what we're listening to because it's too loud, it's too noisy, then that will probably suppress our enjoyment of what we're tasting, uh, the kind of sensation transference. The more we like what we listen to, the more we like what we taste. Um, probably loud noise and music does suppress sweetness, does suppress saltiness, as I mentioned for the, in the air. What it also does is um, suppress your ability to pick up the alcohol content in the drink. It's sort of less discriminating. Um, and uh, uh, beyond that, it does seem to lead to a significant increase in consumption in drinking. And so, for example, you know, in some of the mission statements of places like the Planet Hollywood or um, or a Hard Rock Cafe, they're going to have it in their mission statement: "We will play loud, fast music always, because it will lead to a thirty percent increase in in drinks consumption." Oh, they do say that. Okay. Yeah, uh, it's right there in black and white. And um, so I think it yeah, does lead to drinking more. I think about not just about the loudness, but then of course the tempo of the music, maybe with it's major or minor um, and so on. Um, and uh, yeah, it's there. And it's pretty, you know, that is the sound is probably the easiest bit of the environment to change. Maybe they could increase their sales if they painted the walls, Baker Miller, it's kind of chewing gum pink. Uh, but that's kind of a bigger investment and harder to change back if you don't like it. Whereas music, it's really the, the one sense that we can instantaneously change, flip, experiment with, and that's part of them, maybe the magic or the opportunity. And then what happens then when we eat and listen to different kind of music, musical styles, and, and, and different tempos? A lot of research to suggest that you know, if our... Uh, choice of what food to order if we've got an option say in a cafeteria or something will be biased by um the music in the background so you play a bit of flamenco people order paella more often uh, nesson dorma um pavarotti and suddenly it's lasagna that uh, is going off the shelf so you can use sort of ethnic or the music that people associate with certain sort of, uh, trees or ethnicities of cuisine to bias their choice um if one plays classical music, then people will often spend more in cafeterias, in restaurants, in supermarkets, even if that classical music seems like incongruent with the concept. So uh, I came across one study of a African restaurant somewhere in California. Again, when they found playing classical music in an African restaurant also increased sales. So you can use that for that purpose. Um, I think you know this, this notion of sensation transference, the idea that you know the more the people like what they're listening to, the more they say they like what they're tasting, is a powerful one as well. So it's another way in which music can uh, uh, affect us. And then the sort of final one that we're especially interested in is this idea of sonic seasoning, which is that music or soundscapes can be used to accentuate a certain taste. Uh, not just make you drink more or faster or spend more, uh, but actually, you know, dial up the sweetness, dial up the salt, dial up the bitterness, suppress the sourness, something like that. So we worked with British Airways a few years ago and they had like a sonic seasoning uh, tracks you could plug your headset into, into the armrest and listen to music matching the food. Uh, a few other airlines have tried that since. And now we're starting to see the emergence of, of coffee shops. There's a couple of coffee shops in Korea currently where you can come in, sit down at the counter, have a conversation about which coffee you want to drink. Is it you know, the Arabian or the Colombian or the uh, whatever, the Kenyan uh, blend? Uh, and then put the headphones on and there's music designed to match uh, uh, each of the coffees. And everyone's there kind of at the counter drinking their own particular coffee that they like, but having a headset on to listen to the music that matches that particular taste experience. So this pairing, you know, we, we, the whole area of pairing food and drink started out, I guess, a few decades ago. It was only something that happened at high-end restaurants with food and wine pairing. That was it. Uh, but interest in pairing as kind of an example of sense exploration in a way. How do our senses connect? Has gone beyond food and wine to food and beer, you know, to cheese and tea, to chocolate. And, um, and then beyond pairing foods and flavors, this why not pair tastes with music? So based on your scientific research, 
and others. What are the insights and learnings for chefs and brands? And I'm gonna list some of them here, like start with coffee, uh, wine, beer, you've done on salt, chocolate, salad, tofu, and chips. So give us your stronger learnings and insights in front more in, like if brands want to learn this and implement it themselves. So, um, well, I think a lot of the the early work on uh, pairing music and sounds with tastes has happened in uh, the high end restaurant context through the likes of uh, Joseph and Steve uh, and Heston Blumenthal and others. Uh, clearly, that's an ex esoteric, expensive ish and uh, hard to get into experience. So uh, you might say, well, who cares about pairing? But I think as soon as the food and drinks brands get interested in this and say, how can they enhance the experience of the consumer at home uh, through delivering a multi-sensory experience and not just a cup of coffee or um, a bag of salad, then that's suddenly where this thing sort of scales up the impact um, to the masses and uh, starting with coffee, working with a uh, curry coffee in the States uh, and creating sort of Spotify playlists to match each of five different blends of coffee. I think we'll then, you know, have you know, potentially millions of people drinking their coffee while listening to music, thinking about whether it matches, whether it's a good match, does it change the taste or not? And in the past, we worked with the likes of uh, Starbucks. Um, when they were trying to launch in the UK, uh, Starbucks via kind of a, a coffee at home. And so much of the Starbucks experience is always you know, portrayed as it's all about the store, it's all about the soft, the sofas. So if you start to take the coffee away from the store and serve it in the home, well, are you losing a lot of what's special? Uh, and so we worked with them and with a uh, DJ to come up with a, uh, a track uh, that people could download to enhance the, the taste of the coffee. Um, and probably there's no perfect um, music, both because you know, we live in different taste worlds and some of us like sweet coffee, some of us like acidic, uh, some of us like you know, chocolatey, others like you know, fruity notes. Uh, some of us drink coffee to, for the flavor experience, others drink it to you know, wake them up in the morning to give them an alert and a boost. So there are lots of different functions for coffee, but nevertheless, regardless of your taste world, I think you know, there's a, a sonic soundtrack that can accentuate the tastes that you like and suppress the ones that you don't like. Uh, there is, you know, soundscapes, music that can help to make you a more alert. And then hopefully, if you're having an alerting coffee, sniffing the alerting aroma of the coffee and listening to the alerting music, you might get that super additive boost um, that we were talking about earlier. Wine uh, 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 and music is uh, another big one, both because wine is complex and also for some reason it always feels to me that no matter what food or drink you're interested in studying, be it coffee or chocolate or margarine, there's always 10 times more research in the world of wine and X than there is in coffee and X. An interesting uh, uh, case and one that has you know, attracted a lot of interest. There have you know, been radio shows pairing wines and music, not very good radio shows in the UK, but still there have been some. There are now, you know, um, this may be the future, sort of wine apps that you can scan the label of the wine bottle in the store and you'll get a musical recommendation to match the grape. It's happening first in wine, not in anything else. Um, beer is uh, another one we like. Again, no one really studies beer so much, but all the same questions you ask about wine, about coffee, you can ask, here's another complex, bitter tasting thing. It's harder to work with because beer often has a head, a foam, and that kind of you know, disappears over time. So it's harder to actually get your stimuli done. This beer is very uh, citrusy, hoppy, whatever it might be. Uh, here are the sounds and the shapes and the colors that match that taste attribute in the beer. Uh, hence, this is the best music or soundscape. Uh, we've done you know, virtual reality interventions with Guinness, taking three of their beers, uh, Guinness, Hop House, Lager and uh, Porter, uh, and having people in the supermarket putting on the virtual reality headset, taste testing these three beers as we show different visuals, different sounds, different shapes, different movements. Uh, and so that was kind of a nice uh, example to you know, perhaps revolutionize the taste test 
who go for a much more idiosyncratic approach, say, you know, this was the beer that reminds me of when I was 17 and this happened, and this was the music that was playing on the radio. So people like, uh, sorry, his first name, Dan Brown? Uh, one Brown in England who goes around and does a very sort of successful show in, in pubs and places with his own personal story, matching seven beers to seven bits of music. I think that's got value too. It's just different from the way that we do it. Um, but of course, yeah, we're, we're, so far we've got beer, we've got wine, we've got coffee, and maybe none of these are necessarily especially healthy items. Some less <laughs> healthier than others. So the question is, can you take the sort of sonic seasoning approach and then also apply it to something healthier, which might be the example of you know, salad, um, leafy greens, vegetables. Is there music, is there sonic seasoning that makes vegetables taste better? That is a question that gets asked a lot. Not one for which there is much research yet, um, but one might think in the way that the sounds of the sea can make seafood taste better. Will the sounds of nature make the vegetables taste better? Um, do we instead go for something you know, many vegetables have crunch, your celery, your carrots, your apples. Um, so can we enhance that sound? Uh, in some way, sounds of nature, or uh, or uh, you know, there are others out there. I guess we're making some you know, vegetable orchestras, aren't there? Making. You know, <laughs> I'm sure there uh, is. <laughs> there's, um, so I think it's a, a challenge, more a slightly more challenging case, uh, but I'm very much working on that. And we just published, I just published my first paper on the psychology of lettuce last year, which I never imagined I'd do. <laughs> we're taking the insights, and I, and I think you know that, um, many of the same ideas you can probably can be applied uh, to healthier foods. And we're just, we're just launching, or just been launched this week, last week in New Zealand, a, um, with Convita, a honey company, a multi-sensory experiential honey tasting. And it's got music and visuals. It's got the sounds of the hives. It's got, you know, sounds and the sights of the flowers, the, the, the bees. And I just saw also a, um, Caroline Hopkinson, who's a, a kind of culinary artist who we worked with years ago on a bit of sweet chocolate lolly. She came out last year with a, like a 10 track playlist, especially composed and 10 foods that was to be sent out to school kids and places as part of an educational program. And the final course on this little taste kit was a honey flavored sweet. And they've got this great like 10 minute recording from inside the hive. Uh, people will then slowly suck on the on the on the on the on the, on the sweet while listening to the, the the soundscape. So I think you know there is an opportunity there to to bring the nature element uh, in. So overall, you would say like uh, your research has shown that sound has an impact. You can use it to enhance it. You can use it to change the perception to what you want it, right? The brand. So it is right. important to think about it depending on um, the context and what they want the consumer to feel and think. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it, it, it's, it's definitely important because it can, if you're not careful, you know, you may suppress your consumer's experience if you have no control over the, the environment which they're tasting. So any, any tips you can ha give to optimize the environment should likely enhance the experience. Uh, giving people the opportunity to season their food to their individual taste is another direction because we all do live in different taste worlds. So why do we all get the same food? Of course, seasoning with sugar and salt is not so good for us, but sonic seasoning has none of the calories, um, doesn't lead to hypertension as far as I know. So so that offers a sort of a, a good way of inner personalization. What would you say then it's your best practice as to brand leaders to harness the sonic seasoning techniques as a part of their marketing strategy and in their restaurants? Future will come through sort of uh, digital technologies providing um, something more than just the flavor of the food and beverage product that it's going to be increasingly difficult to charge a premium for a branded product when all the taste tests say that people can't tell the difference. If you just deliver the product, uh, you kind of lost, say, when I think about the experience, how do I deliver an experience, not just the product? Part of that experience is the sound. Sound is the easy sense to change. Sound is, the, is, is a sense that can be switched on and off, changed at will, um, that does have an, an emotional impact. 
more than perhaps other stimuli. So I think it's a great opportunity through sort of sensory apps. We'll build on the ubiquitous technology um, to offer yeah, differentiated experiences that engage more senses. Um, they're probably sort of, you know, in some sense, fun and playful that, um, that allow almost the consumer to explore, so hence the sense inspiration. It's not telling him this is going to do this, but you know, let's explore together, see what impact it has, which is more open uh, and co-creation is probably too grand a term for it, but it, it's, it's a bit more um, of a sort of a learning exploratory process that the that, that, that brands undertake with their consumers. Um, I think we're going to see more and more of these sensory apps coming out first, the ones that are putting out already, which are you know, tied to specific uh, brands, to the hagen ice cream to your Krug champagne, but maybe in the future it will be more of these more um, cross-category sensory apps that allow you to season your food or, you know, or perhaps even, I wonder, could I add, you know, I remember the, you know, from the old days of, of, of hi-fis, we'd have all the graphic equalizers and you could have the, you know, the stadium setting, the church setting, the, um, so could you have a, a, a taste equalizer, a, tea, a tasty cue, I want to call it, that would allow you to take your playlist or whatever you have on your mobile device, that you're, the music that you enjoy most, hence maximizing sensation transference, and then tweak it maybe at meal times to have a sweet playlist, either sweeter tracks from the ones you like, or just um, uh, uh, play with a, a slightly higher pitch to bring out sweetness, say, um, it's sort of exciting. Well, the, the brands should just, they, they should go out and experiment, right? It's it's very yeah. contextual, so they that's the thing. Dare to experience, and and as I say, what I love about it is like gamification. So everything in the stores and the restaurants mm -hmm. see it as like as you said, price and the food and the ingredients won't be competitive anymore. So how do you bring in the entire gamification experience, as I call it, to to mm -hmm. increase it? Um I'm just writing at the moment currently about this uh, sort of extends in the, in the restaurant case then, given you know, the, the massive rise in uh, takeout and home delivery of food, mm. then maybe we are at a, a moment now where those restaurateurs, the chefs, uh, the delivery brands are in a sort of perfect place and a perfect time to enhance the offering and maybe it's through takeaway and home delivery food, that's the way it's going to happen and get, go to the masses. Again, you can't deliver the food, but uh, and more and more chefs. I've just been looking at how many chefs are doing meal kits at the moment during lockdown when the restaurants are closed and how many of the most successful ones are offering the Spotify playlists to go along with the food, uh, the candles and, uh, and are trying to deliver the experience. Let's get into music for good, uh, which I discussed with Steve Keller, uh, and I absolutely love it because you guys work towards using sound to nudge people towards a healthier eating behavior. As you said before, like the wine, the coffee, the salt, you know, the sweet is not really healthy. You guys want to reduce the sugar and salt in food while keeping the perception of the diner constant. So share with us some examples and your goals and how far are we from this dream? We've taken some number of steps uh, along the path. Um, there's there's sort of one section of uh, uh, sound and well-being. Maybe there are three strands to it, really. There's one in terms of what can you do in the, in the sort of food context. So uh, like by adding sonic sweetness, and there are some cafes already doing that, playing sweet music all day long to reduce sugar. Um, so that, that's one strand. There's probably a separate strand about biasing, nudging our behavior. I, I mean, I clearly first said this in jest, but the more I think about it, maybe the more likely it is. If we know, and we do know, that the style of music affects our food choice, Italian music, Italian food, uh, whatever, uh, French music, French food, paella, and, uh, 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 and um, so on, Spanish music. Knowing that, should we be surprised that, you know, the burger is the most popular food and we spend so much of our time listening to North American music? Is one thing partly responsible for the other? Uh, North American uh, foods, not many of them necessarily all that healthy. So, you know, should we all be listening to, you know, Japanese music, so that's much more sort of fish-based and a healthier diet and they all live to 100? Uh, can we nudge people that way in, in, in terms of the style of music through, you know, taking things like the sound of the sea dish 
uh, this comes to the table at the Fat Duck restaurant with the sounds of the sea and the waves and tried to use that in a fish shop setting, fish store. Uh, our colleagues, if you tried it in the supermarket setting to try and nudge people to buy more fish, fish being a healthier choice than maybe um, red meat, uh, suggestive evidence that it works, but perhaps not what the, not what the supermarket owners want because it kind of reduced meat sales while increasing fish sales. So I have to be a bit careful, but it certainly that it worked, that had an influence was clear. As a second strand. So what else can we do in uh, the various places where we make our food choices? Um, and uh, for me, I'm really interested in, in, in how it is that I'm here in nature, in, in, in Colombia at the minute, and emerging literature on the benefits of the nature effect of being in the blue and the green of water and trees and um, with an evolutionary story. But most of that nature effect literature has been around what we see that we can see out of our window greenery makes us better, helps us recover from, from ill health sooner. Um, but the sounds of nature, I think, are equally important. And now emerging literature on, you know, the more kinds of birds you can hear, the better you feel and the faster you recover. And how many chefs have been incorporating nature sounds into their restaurants, from the sound of the sea, to Chef Joseph having the sounds of the forest and the birds. and. Um, so how are these chefs somehow intuitively picking up on the well-being effects of nature sounds in their restaurants? It's also congruent with the food, of course, but uh, so that's another interesting angle. And the final bit would be then, you know, can we, can we make that nature sounds, if we can understand what's key about them, it's a number of varieties of birds, can we create digital versions or augment reality because, you know, here I can hear maybe three kinds of birds physically, but if I added another three digital bird types, do I create a more uh, sort of mixed reality that's more beneficial for me? Uh, so we're interested in that as a future thing. And then the final bit would be uh, sort of linked in sort of a hospital context about sort of sound and well-being um, and sounds role in surgery, in pain relief, in recovery, in dealing with grief. Um, and clearly it can help in all of those areas. Surgeons operate better with music, patients recover quicker, require less painkiller in some cases with the right sort of music. Um, that's sort of an exciting area. We just did a big review of everything on music and medicine. Uh, and again, that leaves me thinking, all the music that's been created to date has been created in you know, about you know, three and a half minutes for a radio or something. It's never been created for that purpose to relieve pain. It's never been created before really to add taste to food. So, you know, what will happen when the musical creatives do start to turn their minds to making music for pain relief? What would that sound like? How would it be different? Uh, or it, does it even make sense in that maybe we don't know enough about how music works to, to be able to predict what will be successful? Maybe we just have to let music do its thing and then pick from the tracks that end up being successful and popular and liked, kind of grabbing those in and those will be better in the long run. So the finally, then I want to know, when was your moment of gastrophonic satisfaction? The perfect meal, I had to have my two best uh, gastronomic moments uh, from, from the coast in the Caribbean and, uh, and the surprisingly good restaurant in, in Paris. Um, I think about Generally, though, what I'm amazed by is uh, every now and again, uh, I get to go to the Fat Duck restaurant in Bray uh, from Heston Blumenthal. And what amazes me about that is how five or six hours can disappear without you realizing where they've gone. So I think that is something extraordinary in that. And every time I, I catch the last train home to Oxford, um, and every time the waiter has to come and tap me on the shoulder and say, suspense, we've got a car for you, you know, the last train's about to, um, <laughs> and, and I know it's coming and every time I say, I must finish, you know, get, I don't have a watch, which doesn't help, but every time somehow just time disappears, flies, and that's a, a magical thing. Uh, I haven't seen anyone else who can do it quite the same way to make time uh, uh, fly. Lovely. Thank you very much, Charles. It's been a pleasure to be able to, dig into your brain and you know share your story i truly appreciate it oh, <laughs>
Well, that's all for today's episode of The Power of Audio, Science and AI. I'm Jasmine Moradi, your host, and thank you very much for listening. Don't forget to subscribe and support by sharing this content on your social media. This episode is supported by Stockholm Music City.